This is the Friends of History Debating Society. I am Gaius, and I welcome Germanicus. We're in Londinium. It's the first century AD. We're Roman citizens, equus class. We don't work. We have Greeks to work for us. They're very good. They're very able. They don't make mistakes. We are not in, interested in the Senate. We don't spend the money to be senators. We're far away from Rome. Nothing but trouble at Rome. There's money too, but trouble comes with it. Right now, the emperor is unpopular. Not our concern. We're surrounded by retired centurions. After 25 years in the legions, they're very happy to be here in Londinium. It's not a big city, but it's a safe city. And we know here by the Thames, drinking our cup of wine, that it will be safe for the next 2,000 years. It will not be conquered, not even slightly challenged as a city. We can see 2,000 years ahead. And of note, we've become most concerned about the 21st century. Although because we're Romans, we project our history on the 21st century. It's, a, it's, a, it's an acceptable argument because the empire that... Augustus created, was inherited by a series of empires for the next 2,000 years, and one of them is America. Germanicus, a very good evening to you. Thank you for this. Tiberius, we discussed last week when we talked about the year of five emperors. That would be the candidate Trump, the candidate Vance, the candidate Harris, the unknown candidate with Harris, and the president, Biden the year of five emperors. A week later, nothing's been sorted out, so we're going to plow ahead. We're going to say our Tiberius, having stepped aside, if that's what it is, remains on Capri, unavailable for transparency. And he's been replaced momentarily, not fixed yet, but it's a suggestion and the attention is going in that direction. He's been replaced by a strong member of his administration, the vice president, Kamala Harris of California. And here in the first century AD, we have a model. The best possible outcome for this replacement would be that Harris is in the role of Cleopatra, the queen of the Nile, the breadbasket of the Mediterranean basin. The key to the success of the Roman Empire was to be able to feed it and, it'll, and Egypt contributed. But we both know that Cleopatra had civil war problems, brothers and family and people after her throne. We also know that Caesar took advantage of her queenliness. And then Mark Antony took advantage of her queenliness. It came to a bad end. But while she was on top, she was extremely successful. The Democratic Party is promoting Harris as a Cleopatra. And I accept that. That's the best case scenario. Your observation of Cleopatra in our time, we remember her as powerful. Is that adequate for the moment that we see in the 21st century? Good evening to you, Germanicus. Good evening, Gaius. Cleopatra was an extraordinary woman. She was a Hellenistic. Greek dynast. She was incredibly capable. And of course, Egypt, as the richest and most powerful place in the Greco Roman world, was the prize for which Romans competed relentlessly. Uh, Mark Antony had embraced it and he hoped to take the riches of the East and control Rome. Uh, he was overthrown along with Cleopatra at Actium in 31 BC, but the fact remains that her legacy is one of an especially even extraordinary Greek ruler who happened to be a woman. Now, that is the starkest contrast to Kamala Harris that one could possibly imagine, because the fact is that Kamala more 
closely represents the women who were used and put up to rule briefly in the period of late antiquity. Now, of course, as you mentioned, uh, in, in Rome, after Cleopatra, in the uh, Principate and the Roman Empire, there were no women who had uh, imperial title. However, that changed in late antiquity. And um, in the Ostrogothic kingdom, <laughs> which was after the so-called fall of Rome in 476, but it was still totally Roman, you had uh, Amala Swintha, who was the Ostrogothic queen, who um, was in a position after her son died and uh, things were unstable after the death of Theoderic, she became the queen, but she only lasted six months. And, and you see this again and again later because in the Byzantine world, which was essentially the, the second Rome, you have other empresses like uh, uh, Zoe uh, Carbonospina in the 10th century, and you also have Zoe Porphyrogenitus in the 11th century, and these were women who came into a position of empress. And then, according to their predilection, their capability, they became either successes or failures, depending on how they were able to manipulate the men around them who were part of the dominant world of, of Rome. And that wasn't Cleopatra. She didn't manipulate. No. She, she, she had a, a relationship with Caesar. The two were going to rule the Mediterranean together. And then Caesar was murdered. And so she had the same plan with Mark Antony. And they came very close. Yes, they did. And, 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 you know, Cleopatra, we have to remember, was a powerful ruler who had the kind of control and capability to run a state that was desperately desired by Rome. And that is in complete contrast with the women I've just mentioned, who were Byzantine empresses and the Visigothic uh, Queen Amala Swintha, who were stand-ins, they found themselves in a position of rule and they didn't last long. And if they did last, as was the case with uh, Zoe Porphyrogenitus, she, she had to manipulate men. And this is the issue that we have to look at with uh, Ms. Harris in the sense that she is a found person. She is in the same uh, imperial status in habitation of these Byzantine empresses, and she can sink or swim. She can take hold of the world that she's in and start garroting people who are, you know, uncertain of her, or she can go down. And the, the, this is what makes this situation so interesting is that her entire provenance is one of a dependency on, on male uh, benefits, you know, of, of gifts from the men going back to, you know, her time in San Francisco. And so 30 she, seconds, Germanicus, 30 seconds. She needs to be able to take hold of her situation and transform that quickly. And it's not certain, given her provenance, that she'll be able to do that. This is the Friends of History Debating Society. I'm Gaius. Germanicus is with me, and we're going to the year 1964. Germanicus and I are old enough to remember 1964. We were young people. There was a movie that was discordant with the period of strength in America. The movie was called Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop 
worrying and love the bomb. It was dark, dark comedy. It starred Peter Sellers and a raft of terrific character actors. The, the scenario was straightforward. A commander of an air wing loaded with megaton bombs, B-52s, goes mad and orders the air wing to attack the Soviet Union. When Washington learns about this, they spend all of their effort trying to convince the Russians how to bring down this air wing. At the same time, they try to figure out how to recall the air wing. It works perfectly except for one bomber is badly damaged by the Russians, but doesn't go down and is going to ride its way through to a secondary target. This is a counter, counter force strike. They're only hitting nuclear weapon sites. They're not hitting the cities. It's something we talk about today. And therein lies the effort that Germanicus and I are going to lavish on this. Because no one in the presidential contest, which we pay a great deal of attention to, is talking about counter value, counter force. No one's talking about the triad of the submarine fleet, the missile fleet, and the bomber fleet. No one's talking about the nuclear weapons that are being constructed each day by our adversaries. That would be North Korea, the People's Republic of China, and Russia. No one is talking about the fact that they're not looking at nuclear weapons as a bauble. They're looking at them as battlefield necessities. Certainly, Mr. Putin of Russian Federation talks about that. So I come to Germanicus because watching Dr. Strange Love again, and every scene is a treasure. Stop it. What are you doing? You can't have you fighting in the war room. Every scene is a treasure. And yet, where is the argument, Germanicus? Where is it? If, if the two parties are to battle in front of the American people for credibility, when are they going to talk about our nuclear fleet? When are they going to talk about Russia's threats? There's no capacity within the U.S. now, and, and this is certainly a, uh, a kind of ephemeral ether that has been put out by the elite um, that suggests the zeitgeist is completely detached from and remove from the kind of anxious uncertainties of the Cold War. And in the Cold War, the elite ruling class was completely fearful of any kind of nuclear trigger situation. That's why you get failsafe. That's where you get a strange love and, uh, and, other movies later on, like The Day After, for example, or in Britain, you have The War Game. Seven, and days, in, seven days in May. The and you have Seven Days in May. All of this relates to a, an overarching, uh, even obsessive anxiety that at any time the world could be destroyed. They now, weren't wrong, Germanicus. That, no, isn't, they weren't. that wasn't a falsehood. Nobody created it in order to get elected. It was real. How could they be wrong when when the U United States and the Soviet Union each had 30,000 nuclear weapons and bombers, submarines, all sorts of ground missiles on a hair trigger? Now, somehow, thanks to the end of the Cold War and the period thereafter, oh, we've gone into a kind of uh, land of the Lotus Eaters from the Odyssey, where we've completely forgotten all of the former fears we had that there could ever be a nuclear war wiping out humanity. And so now you have a situation where NATO and the United States are prosecuting a war against Russia without any concern that there could ever possibly be a nuclear escalation. And, and part of the tremendous irony in this 
is that China and Russia are producing more nuclear weapons even as we speak. They have strong manufacturing infrastructure for the production of nuclear weapons, whereas in the United States, we cannot produce nuclear weapons anymore. We're very much on, on the edge of being incapable of replenishing our nuclear arsenal in large part because all of the men who created and built those weapons all through the Cold War are, hey, they're in their dotage. They're in their 70s and 80s and there's no one to take their place. We're having enormous problems replacing the land-based ICBMs, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this speaks to a situation where we are living, as they say, in la-la land. And why why did that happen, Germanicus? Why is the public not well informed about the the, the possibility? What, the answer is not who, a happy Who does it suit? The answer is not a happy one. The answer is that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States wrongly uh, assumed that we had defeated the Soviet Union rather than uh, the proper awareness and recognition that the Soviet Union had collapsed of its own, on its own. And so the United States entered a kind of triumphalist mindset, a kind of godlike spirit of the age in which we thought that we would always and forever now be the arbiters of human destiny. And that has shown itself to be a lie, a falsehood. In 1964, it was part of the campaign. That's the Daisy Act. Yes, yes. It was shown once on a Saturday night. It's amazing that we had, there were no videos. It was three channels and they showed the ad, the ad once. It was picked up by news agencies, and maybe you saw a piece of it if you watched the news at 6 or 6.30 right. at night. Black and white, a child taking a daisy going. A girl. What, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, except for what replaced that counting was a countdown by a stentorian voice, and at the end was a bomb. And that was one of the dirtiest ads ever. It was extremely effective. It was, and it was dirty because it was Johnson who had gotten us into the war in Vietnam, of one of the most disastrous American, you know, uh, enterprises of of destruction ever. And and you know, it however shows that the fear of nuclear war was uppermost in American minds. Right. It is Barry Goldwater. nowhere today. Nowhere. Or Barry Goldwater was regarded a bomber. Yes. He was, he was an Air Force general. Yeah, that's true. And he, and he did not talk in any fashion that you could say he wouldn't do that. And Johnson accused him of being hair trigger. And Barry Goldwater did not in any way defend himself. He went in another direction. That was 1964. It's, I think, if I do the addition right, it's sure. some, it's some decades later. Nothing's changed about those nuclear weapons. We have more now and more effective now than we did in 1964. As I recall, in 64, we didn't yet have solid fuel Minutemen. We certainly didn't have anything like the boomers we have under the Pacific right now. Well, they were they were being put into service at that time. And we and the B twenty one. What's that? The one that the the new super bomber that's coming. Yeah, yeah nothing like all, all of which can deliver nuclear weapons, detailed nuclear weapons. Right. It's very careful. They don't have to take out cities. They can take out structure. And no conversation now, Germanicus. Well. We'll, we'll stay away from this, but it is a puzzle. I watched Strange Love on the video. You know, it's easy to call up. I felt like I was the only one watching it last night. And now I'm sure that's not true. I mean, the, in the course of things, somebody else might have been watching it. But it's a particular language that we have. I don't know if the young people have the language. I just don't know. Do they know what mad is? 
No, they're totally removed from the entire thing. And, and this is true in Europe as well. And so uh, Americans generally, as well as Europeans, especially Eastern Europeans, are quite willing to yeah. prick and prod the bear, thinking that it'll never happen, that, that Putin is bluffing, as they say. Well, this is very dangerous. And the accident in Strange Love has never gone away. No. Uh, plan R, the attack plan. <laughs> Slim Pickens. My God, there's a, I, I recommend humbly to those listening to us who haven't seen it recently, because I know you've all seen it. You have a certain age. Try again. Peter Sellers is a genius. And Dr. Strangelove at the end, mind Fuhrer, I can walk. Michael, there, there might not be better lines than that. No, no, Kubrick was brilliant. We're in Londinium. We're going to sacrifice to the god Augustus and go on home because there's the theater's dark tonight at the amphitheater. We've had difficulty getting good acts coming all the way to Londinium. We don't have enough of an audience for them sometimes. They're getting greedy. But okay, fine. They'll be back. They'll miss us. We are, however, going to mention, since we've recommended Cleopatra as an example of a successful queen, lessons of Cleopatra. And I'm going to go first. Cleopatra fled Actium. I don't have any reason to believe she fled it because she was frightened. It wasn't her fight. She didn't need to commit her superior warships to Mark Antony. Mark Antony and Octavian wouldn't settle their dispute. They wouldn't rule the empire together. Marcus Agrippa was Octavian's genius, the, the admiral of his fleet. But Octavian's fleet was much smaller uh, in ships. There were many of them, but they were smaller ships. Antony commanded tens and eights, lots of them, with lots of soldiers. There were diseases, but that was typical of large encampments. There were deserters. That was typical in Roman armies when you have a civil war, back and forth. Antony was a much stronger commander than Octavian. Well, Octavian wasn't a commander at all. He was, he was entirely dependent on Marcus Agrippa, who didn't have the reputation of Mark Antony. But they were generals and admirals, generals. They didn't call themselves any different army at sea, army on the land. Cleopatra was a queen. And there's reason, there's argument for 2,000 years that when she fled or left the scene, suddenly the heart went out of Mark Antony's forces. Do you believe that? Cleopatra was a... Uh... She was looking out for Egypt and for yeah. herself. And because of the immense richness of Egypt, which extended from the early dynasties, 3000 BC, that's 5,000 years ago, all the way to the Ottoman Empire in 1800, for example, Egypt provided a quarter of the Ottoman Empire's revenue. Egypt was the not just the breadbasket, it was the, the font of everything. And she felt that she could retreat and then uh, renegotiate some terms with whatever Roman was in charge. Didn't work out, but the fact is that is exactly what she had been doing with Anthony and Caesar. So she was playing um, a high stakes, great power game and it failed. But she had every reason to believe that, that because Egypt was so central, so powerful that she could continue to do that. And so, you know, that is part of the difficulty looking at the world we inhabit today in the sense that if you mistake your leverage 
if you mistake your capacity to bargain that 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 you are so essential that others will always accommodate to you even after you've you know pricked them and slapped them and punched them in the face th that can lead to a, a great downside and this is in effect what happened with Cleopatra because you know Augustus Octavian was in, in he he had no desire to bargain or negotiate with Cleopatra. He had the legions to be able to just say, well, to hell with you. And in a way, um, Cleopatra is, in this sense, a kind of a metaphor of a great power, because we have to remember that of the three great Hellenistic states that succeeded Alexander, the Ptolemaic dynasty and in Egypt I, was one of the most powerful. And she was operating out of an assessment that, that she was still powerful. And she wasn't able to understand that she couldn't achieve the kind of leverage that she once had. And I think this is a kind of metaphor, if you will, to the United States today is that it still feels it can leverage things when it is no longer in a position to do so. What I like her for, Dramaticus, is that she committed suicide rather than be taken to Rome in a triumph. She wouldn't, she wouldn't submit herself to Octavian humiliating her and her queenship. Octavian, what was Octavian to her? Nothing. A boy. He had no royalty. He had no personality that was vivid. Well, now, she knew Rome once. We yeah. know Augustus, but as Octavian. Yeah, right. Right. And that was part of the problem. And her misassessment of Octavian as a leader is is very much akin to the kind of arrogant misassessment of yeah. Russia. That yeah. the U.S. has made, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Putin, and it's a mistake, and it it's going to bring us down. If America's lucky, it will get a Cleopatra. If it's not, it won't. Friends of History Debating Society, Londinium, ninety A.D., summertime, no theater tonight. We go on home, read our books. Me, I'm going to watch Strange Love again. Gosh, it's fun. You need humor. The darkest humor. There is nothing darker than we'll meet again. Don't know why, don't know when. The fade song with bombs going off. No, that's way, way too clever for 1964 is my memory. Way too clever. Good heavens. Lyndon Johnson was in the White House. It was, it was running for re-election having done the Tonkin Gulf lies. Good yeah. heavens. And we'll meet again. Those right. were the days. Germanicus, Michael Vlahos, Gaius, John Bachelor, Londinium 90 AD. Thank you.